Ladies and gentlemen, for the full story, for the full life, will you please welcome Lord Kirkham. Who's there? <laughs> no, no pressure on us now. <laughs> no. Hiya. Front seat as well. Goodness me. I don't know. So I won't answer the letters so you come here. <laughs> <laughs> we always like to start Business Unplugged by getting to know the guest a little bit more because yeah. as the saying goes, you can't like somebody until you know them. Well, well that makes sense. Where were you born? I was born just outside Doncaster. What's your father's name? My father's name is a name from that era, Tom. Tom. And your mother's name? Um, another name from that era, Elsie. Elsie. You were adopted? I was adopted when I was six weeks old, yeah. You told me that you decided not, when you had the chance to uh, go meet your biological parents, you turned down the chance. Why? Not, not exactly that. Mm. Uh, I never ever gave any consideration to my mum and dad, Tom and Elsie, being anything other than my parents. Mm -hmm. And then when later on people would talk to me and say, aren't you ever interested in finding out who your biological parents were? I said, well, no, I'm, I'm not interested. And I began to analyse why aren't I interested in this? And it was, I just felt it would be letting my mum and dad down, who were my mum and dad, to try and find out about some other people, so it was just not a consideration and never has been. Yeah, I noticed an awful lot of nodding heads um, when you said that. It was the exact same uh, response to when I shared that story with my own wife. Uh, she said, yeah, I can really understand that. Um, who was your biggest influence when you were growing up? Um, I suppose my mum was a huge influence when I was growing up, actually. I think she, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a term you see a lot about and read a lot about today, aspirational. But I think she was quite, even though we were in our humble mining village background, I think she was quite aspirational for me. She wanted me to have a life that was better than the life she'd experienced, I think. Well, Which is not uncommon, is it, really? What was your biggest talent growing up? What did you enjoy the most and what were you good at? Yeah, um, I don't think I was great at many things, but I, as I was growing up, I used to enjoy athletics, would you believe? Sprinting, that was something that I liked. And I collected stamps, that was a big thing of that era. Not very cool, is it? <laughs> do you think that the stamp collecting, uh, because I do know a few stamp collectors and they're quite methodical. Yeah. Do you think you took some of that into your business life later on? No, I don't think so, actually. No, I think that uh, of any talents I may have had, being methodical wasn't particularly one of them. Okay, let's look at the business. What was your first paying job? Um, when I was at school, um, I didn't get a job as a, a paper boy, but I did get a job working for, I don't think it's in business now, they were called thrift stores. And uh, I used to deliver groceries after work on Thursday and Friday evenings and on Saturday. I don't know if I've still got them anymore, but those big bikes had a little front wheel and then a sort of a, a pannier on the front that you could put the, you know, the, back, the, the groceries in and then do your deliveries. Yeah. I was about 14, I guess. Furniture. Yeah. That's where you, you made your name. Yeah. Tell us how you get into furniture. Um, it's interesting, really, because all my life I've wanted to join the Air Force. And... Uh, where people joined the Scouts uh, when maybe a teenager. I joined, joined something called the Air Training Corps. It's still about. I was in Doncaster 303 Squadron. It was like a, a Scouts, but for the for the air. And I always wanted to uh, to, to fly an aeroplane. And uh, I didn't get the necessary qualifications to uh, to really join. To, to become a pilot officer, so I had to look around for some other thing that I could do, and frankly, uh, I'd not thought about it, it was quite challenging. Not as challenging as it, as it is today, but by default I got a job actually as a furniture salesman. Yeah. And then I could see people, see a carpet fitter ran a really successful business, he used to come uh, to the store in a Jaguar motor car, you know, well, I was still going to work on the bus at that time, so I thought he was absolutely tr tremendous. And. Uh, yeah, I aspired, uh, but you know, and, and it seemed to be quite easy to work for yourself. I was ignorant of all the dangers, and I think it was seeing him and his success that encouraged me to, to, to do something on my own account. And clearly, because I'd worked as a furniture salesman for 
the two or three years, it, it, it made some sense to be, it, be in that area. Do you think some people shouldn't go into business? There are many people who are creative or they might invent something, but business is a, is a separate thing. Yeah, I do think some people shouldn't go into business. Uh, very often, I've been married 46 years, but over all those years, very rarely have I shared with my wife all the challenges and difficulties that I experienced in business because I would have felt that it's unfair and perhaps, you know, it's sufficient that I have a few sleepless nights. I didn't necessarily want to so, so, sort of share them, really. What was the question? I forgot. Well, the, the, question, <laughs> the question is, should some people not yeah, go de into de business? definitely. I think the pressure is associated with business, and it's a horses for courses thing, and it isn't for everyone. I mean, it, being an entrepreneur, being in business, it, you, you often hear the words risk taker put alongside that, mm -hmm. and I, I think it doesn't suit everybody. Well, you, you've actually said something there which has led me to another question. You said you didn't say anything to your wife. Now, the relationship expert will say one partner in a relationship should not withhold something. It's not fair on the guy to go into his cave and solve his problems, and it's not fair for the wife to not tell the husband and go off and tell all the friends. The couple should come together and communicate. Now, not everybody can, not every person in a relationship can take on the challenges and deal with them. Some people you know, as you did, but sometimes they can't cope with them. Uh, I think there's enough pressure, or there would have been enough pressure on me dealing with the particular challenges that you deal with every day in business without dealing with the challenge of knowing my wife's also concerned about these challenges, yes. if that makes any sense. Yeah, very good. DFS, just for some people who don't know, what does it stand for? Yeah, I don't really know because when we started the business, uh, we started the business quite unimaginatively calling it Northern Upholstery. Uh, I never really f thought it through, but I never really, I suppose, thought, I had aspirations, but that one day it would be a national business and how perhaps Northern Upholstery would be inappropriate. But uh, we bought uh, the assets of a business about a few years after being in business for a few years, and that business was called DFS. And I don't actually know what the words stand for, and lots of people in the business, as you might imagine, you know, could make up things that go with those letters. But it would be something like definitely fine furniture or discount furniture. But when people would say to me, what does it stand for? I would say it stands for great quality, great value, and a company that it's very fulfilling to work for. <laughs> great value, great quality in the early days. Were, were, were they your motto? Were they part of your mission statement? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I had no formal training. I started off in business pretty uh, early in life. And it just seemed logical to me to want to give to the people that are out there what I would want as a customer. I'd always put myself in the customer's shoes. And I'd say, what would I like? Possibly they would like the same thing. And I couldn't possibly imagine that nobody wouldn't want to have good service. Nobody wouldn't want to have a product that served them well. And, and I also recognized pretty early on that you do need the recommendation of satisfied customers. You want people out in the marketplace, if you can, say, saying good things about you. Yeah. And I think it was just pretty fortunate they had those, those beliefs. What were the biggest challenges for you in the early days? You had two young children setting up a business. Oh, it's, um, it's difficult because I think there are constant challenges really and I, don't, I think it's difficult to single out you know, a, a, a particular challenge. There'd be different challenges at different times. But interestingly enough, I never ever felt we were massively stretched financially. Mm -hmm. The company never ever borrowed any money, but the reason it didn't have to borrow any money is because I was quite a young guy and my aspirations were relatively modest. And while I wanted to grow the business, I could see I had a lot of years ahead to grow it. I wasn't sort of steaming ahead to try and become incredibly successful in a very, very short period of time. Many of the people I've interviewed on Business Unplugged have said in the early days of their career, they look back and they realize they might have been too arrogant. One, one person actually used the word tyrant, but they learned from their mistakes. They just said there was so much pressure, they were trying to move it forward, and it was easier to shove rather than actually pull and, and lead. What kind of a, a leader were you in the early days of DFS? Uh, I think my style as a leader has never changed. It's been an extension of my personality. 
and I'd rather do things by getting people on side and encouraging their support than in that sort of old-fashioned, heavy-handed Victorian manner of being demanding and pushing. And yeah. people only give of their best when you're there chasing them. It would be to create an environment that they wanted to work and uh, make them proud of being part of the association. And where you can, let them know that you hold them in regard for what they do and remunerate them accordingly too. One thing which struck me, very, well many things did, but one thing really struck me as interesting, your philosophy with regards to hiring people, yeah. where you know, you know this person in front of you has mistakes, you'd rather they were open about it, so both of you knew where you were going. Yeah, I mean, years and years ago, um, I used to interview people and meet people and looked for the perfect person for the job, or a perfect person. And then I began to think about it, well, hang on a minute, how many perfect people do we employ in our business? Uh, how perfect am I? And I began to realize that I didn't really know anybody that, that was perfect. We're all full of imperfections. And what you really want to find uh, overall is people who have got uh, more on the plus side, more to offer, than they have uh, on the minus side. And you then need to sort of encourage a bit of honesty from them. And I mean, I've, I've subsequently read in, 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 in books giving advice to businesses that you would ask the question, well, it's not easy to ask somebody what are all your weaknesses because nature makes it that you can't just extol all those weaknesses, if that's the right word. And so you often say, um, look... Looking at yourself through your spouse's eyes, uh, what would they see as your principal weaknesses? And I find over, found over time, by being just warm and genuine with people, they would relax. They would perhaps forget that it is an, an interview of such, and they would be open and honest. You don't have a guy say, do you know what? A guy who came for a job was uh, to do with the transport. He came one morning, I said, you look very relaxed. He said, you wouldn't have thought so. If you saw me about an hour ago, he said, I've had to do get a double whiskey before I even got in the car. <laughs> you know, so I think people can be, be very, very honest if you create that environment. And people would, would actually tell me what their weaknesses were. And it didn't matter to me, but providing they had compensating skills. Yeah. Because we've all got, well, we're all human beings, we're riddled with weakness, really, aren't we? How have you felt when somebody has let you down in your own business? Um, very often, I think it's easy to point a, a, a finger, I'm doing it now, to point in that finger, three pointing this way. I think when you point a finger, I've often felt, I've let them down. You know, we, we picked them in the first instance. But to be honest with you, even over all those years, I don't think we've had a tremendous amount of failures with people, uh, or perhaps, you know, it's just a protection not, not to be able to remember those failures. Yes. I, I was impressed when you spoke about training of staff, and that's come up quite a bit over recent years where many companies, that's one of the things in the budget to go, but you're, you're quite adamant that training... Oh, I think so. I think t two things, certainly if you a business that gives service to the man in the street, the, the consumer there. I think that a marketing budget is something that you shouldn't cut, and I think a training budget is something that you shouldn't cut either. Uh, I think we talked about interviewing people. I don't think ever do you expect to get always the finished product. What you're looking for, in my view, when you're recruiting people, is you're looking for potential. You know, like-minded people that through training and exposure to the way you run the business, you know, can be trained, can become better. So I think it's potential that's important. I think training is absolutely fundamental. I don't think to train somebody, to show somebody, to encourage them, but then to continually keep doing that and, and yeah. try and keep them up to speed. I mean, we're in a forever changing world. We can never know everything anymore. Technology is... Uh, well, as you that. say, we, we can never know everything. Can you tell me about a time when someone came to you with an idea whether it be marketing, sales, strategy, vision, whatever it is, and you thought, whoa, I never thought of that. No, I said we all thought of human weakness, and sometimes people would come to you with an idea and you'd find all the faults with the idea, and then about three months later, once you convinced yourself that it was your idea and not theirs, you began to <laughs> like it and implement it. But so I'm sure there are loads of ideas, but I can't think of any specific huge idea, you know. Yeah. When, when you uh, decide on the, the products, the products yeah. are so important. I mean, it's a bit, many companies will try and give the next best thing or try and introduce something that the, the market doesn't want. 
how did you discover what your customer wanted so you could give it to them? Yeah, well, I think you can only do that actually by listening to the customers. But I said at the outset that my thing was to put myself in the customer's shoes. And I think even though we're a manufacturing setup, because DFS is a, is a vertically integrated business, it not only retails a product, it manufactures the products too. And I could see that the people in the manufacturing side of the business always wanted to make things that we could make efficiently or effectively. That was their principal criteria for making a product. But at the end of the day, the customer, the consumer might not want that product. And, 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 and as far as I was concerned, it was what the customer wants is what we want to give them. We always ought to aim to say yes. And, and when you can look in the marketplace, see the people that are successful and you know, try and emulate the best, the best of that, really. Can you tell us, please, what it's like to be in the House of Lords and you're standing up to give your opinion and stand up for Doncaster and Yorkshire? Yeah, well, when I went to the House of Lords, it was quite a surprise, really, when I got the letter that asked me to do that. And uh, I, like many people, I think I had a lot of preconceived idea. I'd seen these, what I considered to be old guys, sort of asleep. Well, they're not actually asleep because in these benches there are little sort of uh, loudspeakers and uh, they're putting their ears to the loudspeaker. And they really are. You, you look next time you'll see it. And they're closing their eyes because often they're a little bit older than the average age of this audience. And they're concentrating so they can actually hear properly. But when I did uh, join up as House of Lords, Tom Strath Strathclyde, who was the leader at the time, he said, Graham, don't be intimidated by the huge brains that they are in this place. He said, because so many of them are unable to fasten the shoes. And he didn't mean literally, because I now know some of them can't fasten the shoes. But he meant that, as a lot of them are judges and academics, it meant that they weren't always into practical matters. They could debate things. And uh, the first uh, debate that I was involved in, and it's 12 years ago now, it was called the promotion of homosexuality in schools. And the first two days were debating the definition of the word promotion. You know, so what the House of Lords does, it makes law and amends law. So it was different to imagine, and I'll never forget, and I almost feel embarrassed now when I, when I say this to you. He said, don't be intimidated by these huge brains. And I said, Tom, I'm not intimidated. And I wasn't really intimidated at all, but I now realize I should have been intimidated. In ignorance, I just didn't recognize how able, capable these people were, and actually how they're the, the best people in the world. And I've no axe to grind for the House of Lords. I go there, I enjoy it. I'd like to think I make a contribution, but I never, I don't take any expenses. I take no payment for going there because I, I, I don't need to do that. So I can give an impartial view. The people that for whom it's their life, Mm -hmm. They can't give that impartial view. But I think to dismantle it and replace it by something different will be a backward step. Because at the moment, it's made up with people from all walks of life, all different sort of age, age groups and, and, and both sexes, who actually do a very, very good job. And the only people that want it reformed are the people like Perry Ashdown. And it's because they say um, the way that people got here shouldn't be the way because it's by patronage. It's by somebody fancying that you can do a good job there. Uh, and, and they feel it should be some fairer sort of a system. I don't disagree with that, but the fact is that they, they do a very good job, in my unbiased view. What do you prefer to be called, or what do most people call you? When you join up at the House of Lords, you go and see the clerk, and the clerk tells you how it all operates from now on. And he gives you a piece of paper and says, well, you signed your name before, Graham Kirkham. You don't do any of that anymore. Now you sign Kirkham. And through the whole of the process, you get your note paper, uh, the, the whole thing, I forgot the question already. What did I? What, what do you prefer? He's, as I spend more time with the House of Lords, I'm becoming, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I prefer Graham. And uh, I used to be, and still am, not embarrassed about it, but I think it can be very flash and grand. And I go into places where I've got uh, an appointment, and I'll say, uh, it's Kirkham to see whoever it may be I'm seeing. And then I hear them ring upstairs and say, it's Mr. Kirkham to see him. And it was with your relative, now deceased, Donald Thompson, Sir Donald Thompson. And he and I went to see the Chinese ambassador in London. And the ambassadors are called Your Excellency. And I said, it's Sir Donald Thompson and, uh, and Graham Kirkham to see His Excellency. And she rang upstairs and said, it's Sir Donald Thompson and, and Mr. Kirkham. And Donald said to me, Graham, if you're not proud of this title, and you should be, then give it him back. 
And he said, if you're proud of it, use it. So I actually find that I actually do use it. Very good. And I'm proud of it. What, what's, what's the best thing you've said in the House of Lords? For uh, I think the best thing really is where you can do a fair bit of preparation and it was my maiden speech which was 12 years ago and I'm chairman of the Duke of Edinburgh Wood and, and I'm a trustee of Outward Ben. I'm really keen on, on, on sort of young people. I think they are our tomorrow whether it's in businesses or, or, or the world as a whole. And the maiden speech was about young people and how important it is for us to look after young people, educate and guide young people. And, and that's the thing I've read it many, many times that I'm actually most proud of. And the, uh, very interesting, really, because it was uh, the head legal officer, I'm forgetting exactly what that post is, for the opposition. And they comment immediately that you've made a maiden speech. And thereafter, everybody that speaks comments and says how wonderful speech was. Whether it's wonderful or not, it's just the way that it works. It's protocol. And he said, and it was good to listen to Lord Kirkham's maiden speech, uh, and interesting uh, how much emphasis he placed on children and care. And, and I had, it was non-partisan. I talked about, I'm a Tory peer, but I talked about how well the Labour Party had done with the schooling and the whole thing. I talked about my mining background and my mum and dad's humble mining village setup. And he said, I trust it won't be uh, too long before uh, Lord Kirkham is speaking from the front benches, at which point everybody in our front benches and the back benches cheered and thought that was great. He said, however, I feel he would be more suited and appropriate to speak on our benches than that of the benches opposite. So he said, it's quite interesting. Oh, wow. Um, tell me, your, your wife, uh, explain this yeah. to, to me in, in my ignorance, what, does your wife have a title? Yeah, they're called Lady Kirkham. And how does she feel about being called Lady Kirkham? Well, I think she quite likes that. <laughs> <laughs> so she uses that all the time, does she? Um, we got some advice from someone else that was in the House of Lords, uh, and a friend's wife, and she said that the first thing people do is change the credit card so they can actually see it. But she always changed the credit card but retained one that didn't have the title on it because sometimes it can work well for you and people like it. Other times it works against you and people think you're seriously up yourself, really. So, <laughs> to use the vernacular. In our conversation last week, uh, I mentioned about uh, a guy called Wayne Dyer talking about people who make, it, make a big success of themselves, but then they deny their children that opportunity to grow because they give them things on a plate. How have you brought up your children? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, people say, have you ever got any regrets? Uh, would you do things differently? I always say no, because I think it's very negative. You can't do things differently that are past. Um, and I don't think I would do anything differently. But for sure, I can see in my case, I always wanted my kids to have a much better future uh, and, and, and a better time than perhaps I had in, in business and growing up generally. And I think that is a fault. Uh, the term you often hear is you teach the children to fish, not give them fish. And I think that that for sure is what you should do. I don't think you're doing your children any favours by making life, life easy for them. What were the, the values that you instilled in your children growing up? Again, I never sat down and thought these are the values I want to bring my family up with. These are what I want to think are important to them. I think the way I run the family, as you might say, as head of the family, would be the same way uh, I, I, I led a business, really, leading from the front by example. Yeah. I think honesty is desperately important because actually I think one of the worst things you can ever do is to delude yourself. I think it's a, it's a cardinal sin. And uh, I think it's very rare today, uh, but I mean, a characteristic that I've developed over 40 years in business has been massively cynical, but uh, life has taught me that. You know, I mean, people have very often, I feel, let you down, don't come up to snuff and expectations, and, uh, and, and very often are not honest. And so I think it's, it's important to be honest to yourself and to other people. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a key value. And also, I think, uh, not to be self-important. Yeah. You know, I don't think that's attractive to anybody. I think it's... Uh, I think to try and be normal is, is quite important. I think you need to fit in to society overall. Or people who don't even know you dislike you. I mean, I've driven because I've just been basic, as I've got more money than I want to have a nicer motor car, a nicer house. South Yorkshire, Doncaster, it is a 
you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, in the old term would be working class region, an old mining area. When I drive in, in my flash motor car, very often people wave to me, not always like this, sometimes in other ways. And, <laughs> and when I take a car from what would be the carpool, a more conventional everyday car, driving in exactly the same way, people don't treat you the same. So I think it's... Uh, well, if, if that's the case when you're in a posh car, What's it like when you're in your helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> well, they can't do that finger thing too, though, can they, really? <laughs> so, I, I learned something new today about helicopters and the weather that, that we're having at the moment. Would you like to tell them about that? Yeah, I mean, helicopters are great, really, and I'm not involved in helicopter because I'm flash genuinely. I'm involved in helicopter because if you run a retail business that spans all of the UK, it's the efficient and effective way of getting around, really. Uh, but there is some problems. Uh, helicopters can't fly when it's really really cold because the uh, rotors ice up and that's not a good thing and um, clearly they can't fly when they can't see and uh, you know very often you're on the ground and you can see for miles but it's up in the air so i was in london this morning and to fly from battersea at 9 35 so i was about to leave the hotel at nine o'clock when i got a telephone call first thing i did when i got up look outside the window it was a perfect day and it was from Val, who's worked for me for 36 years, to say that the pilot had been on. It was 200 foot of visibility. They couldn't leave East Midlands where the helicopter lives. So uh, I just arrived here, you know, with moments to spare for, for the first thing this morning. So, you know, it's not all plush, you know, all in these helicopters. <laughs> and there's me putting down the deposit for a helicopter this <laughs> week. <laughs> Change my mind. We spoke about uh, your, your children. Uh, your wife, who else is in your close circle who you maybe rely on for advice or maybe you, you know, your, your, your close advisors? Oh, that's a tough question. Most questions you get asked at my stage of life or career, you've sort of been asked before, so you've got a standard sort of an answer. Um, I'm not just sure I can readily and easily answer that, but I do rely, uh, you know, my expertise, if I have any, is in a very narrow area, and uh, when I take advice, I go to get the best advice that I think is available, whether it's advice in law or advice in financial areas or whatever, but... Um, I tell you, I tell you the, let me tell you the reason why I asked that question, because when I met you for the first time, it would be easy for a person to say, I've made this amount of money, now I'm going to chill out and I'm just going to put my feet up. But I came away full of enthusiasm after our meeting, um, not, out of, not just out of uh, respect for, for the respect you gave me, but I just felt this person has the energy of a 20-year-old it's like he's got so much more to do, he wants to read more, do more, meet more people, continue. You just don't want to stop. So the reason I ask you that, it's, it's a question that might seem odd asking someone who's been so successful and at your age, but I don't see you as someone who's just about to say, right, I'm putting my feet up now. No, uh, but that's not for people used to say to me, oh, isn't it great you don't smoke? Well, I don't smoke because I've never wanted to smoke. That is how I'm actually made. I don't want to go to the gym. I don't like that. But I know lots of people go there and they're actually turned on and they're massively motivated. It's just natural. That it's in my genes that I actually want to work. It gives me a great deal of satisfaction. I've hated the term that's coming in life about quality time, that, uh, you know, you go to work and then somehow else there's some other time that's quality time. All my life's quality time. I just love to be at work. It's massively fulfilling. It's not onerous or hard for me. Yeah. And that's what I always want to do. That's what, what I'm about. That's what I find fulfilling. How, how does your wife feel about you feeling that way about work? Yeah, I think, I think over 46 years you get used to it. <laughs> and I think the fact that the marriage has lasted and successful for all that period of time is that she's made an, an adjustment to that, really. 
Who's your favourite character in Coronation Street? <laughs> yeah, well, Coronation Street, I love dearly. You know, I'm, I'm really, really delighted that there's been a lot of uh, demand in the House of Lords this last three weeks through whips because of the national health thing and because of, of welfare to go there. So I've missed quite a lot. And I didn't even know that Frank had been murdered. It was only really through uh, <laughs> reading in what's on telly in the mirror on Saturdays that I found this out. But I looked through it all and I guessed, actually, that it was his mum. So I was really pleased about that. That was unveiled on, on Monday. Uh, but my favourite, I think Becky, you know, was now out of the series. She oh, was yeah. great. It was a really good character, actually, yeah. But I like Leanne as well, you know. She's <laughs> when we had a conversation uh, last time at the end, you said, um, oh, you've, you've got to read this book and you've got to read that one. I know you're interested in books. Uh, we, we both share a love of reading. And you gave me one book. Oh, would, you, would you like to mention the name of that book? because it, it made me cry one of the stories. Yeah, oh, genuinely. The book is called The Elephant in the Room, and it's by a guy called Professor Waxman. And Professor Waxman is an oncologist, so he's an expert on cancer. That's where his life has been dedicated. And it's a book of short stories, and it's a paperback. Firstly, I'm not really into short stories. I don't think there's enough time to sort of pan it all. Secondly, you know, I'm not desperately into paperbacks. And uh, thirdly, when you read what it's all about, it's about cancer, treatments, expert. It's the last thing you want to do if you want to be motivated. But I, he gave it, oh, he didn't give me, he told me he, he wrote the book. I actually went and bought the book, and I liked it so much, having cried non-stop after reading uh, the very first story. Uh, I didn't read the first one. I read Rick and... Uh, that, that was the, the very first, first one, one, yeah. yeah, yeah Rick's great second. experience. Yeah. It takes about 25 minutes to uh, to read. But I recommend it to you strongly. I'm on no form of commission, but that is some serious book. You know, the power that somebody through words can actually pull all these emotional strings is incredible, and it just shows you what we all can do uh, with marketing, really. You know, I, I knew, I guaranteed, and I've met you for a very short period of time, I thought if that Darren is not in tears when he's read this story, I, I, I just can't believe it. And he just touched well, me and I said, thank you, by the way, I've just been a flood of tears. <laughs> I mean, it's an incredible story. Oh, and dear. I mean, we had this conversation, I think it might have been one of the reasons why uh, you gave it to me. Um, there are many people who are always looking to the future, and vision and strategy is so important. But the problem is with some people is they're always looking to the future that even when they get to that point that they'd wished for, they don't know how to enjoy it because they're still thinking about the future. Yeah. And, and you're very much, uh, you take every minute of every day very importantly. I think you're dead right. I think that people set off, don't they, and they're living at home and they think, wouldn't it be great if I could go and get somewhere on my own and they go and be able to rent somewhere, maybe share it with somebody, an apartment, and then suddenly, you know, they get married and they want to sort of live together so they rent the house. Then they'd love to buy one because they can get what they want and they get some sort of terraced house or semi-detached house and they can hear the neighbours through the walls and they think, wouldn't life be so much better if we'd got a bigger house, a detached house? And years go by and they get a bigger mortgage and they get the bigger house and they still be satisfied they think it would be great if we had a, an acre or two of garden that'd be loads better and then they get an acre or two of garden and decide then they want something else you know this is good but we fixed in England but it'd be nice to have some foreign holidays and this continues always thinking that they're going to be happy when they get to the next stage and then they get to 90 or whatever it was and their life's finished and, and it's always going to be the next thing it isn't that this is now life here and now this is what you have got to, to live and uh, I think, yes, you've got to still prepare for tomorrow because there will be a tomorrow, generally speaking, there isn't. You've got the rent to pay and buy things, so you shouldn't just smash the credit card out and borrow everything. But you have got to live for today. This is it now, here and now. Tell me, one of the things I've noticed with everybody I've interviewed for Business Unplugged is that they don't have time for the negative things in life. And when I mean the negative, I mean the minor negatives. Like, for example, if something happens on the news, they won't talk about it for five hours and not do something about it. We've all met people who, oh, that's terrible, I can't believe that's happening, that's ridiculous. And they work themselves into such a frenzy, but they won't do anything about it. So they've achieved nothing but just work themselves into a frenzy. Um, I've noticed with everyone on Business Unplugged, they have this ability to tune in to, to what the important things are. Yeah, for years and years and years, I used to end up being quite frustrated, not being able to get the results at work that I really 
uh, wanted to get. And uh, then I, I began to realize, and it took a long time to realize, there are certain things in life that are actually inevitable. And um, when it is inevitable, you check it really is inevitable, then I think, and you can't do anything about it, you might as well just sit back and accept that you can't do something about it, you can't do anything about it and beat yourself up. This morning is a very minor example, but Val's telephone call said, Paul has been on the phone, it's 200 foot visibility at East Midlands, you know, he's not going to be able to get there, but it should burn off, it'll be okay later. We really should have got him to go down last night, but there was no weather for it, etc, etc. That was the end of it, there was nothing we could do, I couldn't get up here on the train quick. Quicker. You know, there's no point being frustrated, angry, and still not here. So I think there are certain things you've just got to come to terms with and, and, and put things in perspective in, in reality. There's a brilliant book, and actually I'm, I, I don't earn any money from, from this either. It's called The Magic of Thinking Big. Have you read it? Right, no, uh, not read it. David Schwartz. And he said one of the things to have a positive attitude, before you start thinking of being positive, you've got to have gratitude. And that's one thing I've noticed with yourself. You're, 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 very, you're very gracious, but you've also got an awful lot of gratitude for, you mentioned your mum and your dad. Yeah. Oh, I just think I've been massively, massively lucky. I mean, I don't quite know the process of adoption, how it works, but I'm pretty sure that my mum and dad had walked down a line of kids in cots and said, mm, not that one, too pretty. Not, oh, yeah, that, he looks all right with that big nose, very fat, and just picked me out. You know, so that was a bit lucky for a start, wasn't it? You know? Yeah. So, so I, I've just been massively grateful, uh, and every day I, I just think how lucky that I am, really. You received a book from Malcolm Walker of Iceland, which yeah. was on your desk, uh, the Steve Jobs yeah. autobiography. And there I am reading the Sunday Times on Sunday, and it's, um, it's an article on Malcolm. Yeah, profile And, and he's talking about his favorite book. So you and Malcolm, when you, when you find a book you love, do you buy it for everyone you... No, he, he's not been doing this recently, but, uh, um, I mean, this book impressed him so, so much, as you read. He said it's the best book he's read in his whole life. Mm. It's, uh, it, it is a brilliant book. It's a good book. Now, Malcolm Walker founded Iceland Frozen Foods about similar time to the DFS started in business. And um, he's, he's only had one non-executive directorship, and that was when I encouraged him to join DFS as a non-executive director. I felt he'd, he'd had some gravitas to... To, to the board and we had a good time there but I've known him very very well I've loved his business although it's been a great business and, and I've learned a lot from him and I'd like to think vice versa we all value people tremendously in Iceland uh, you know just got that recognition or award by the Sunday Times for being the, the best employer in the UK yeah. and uh, finally after all these years they were owned by Balger, who then went bust, and the Icelandic banks owned them. And so, for a year, Malcolm's been trying to buy the business uh, back from the banks, and there's been financial constraints. Well, finally, two weeks ago, uh, me and two other investors, one uh, in Dubai and one in South Africa, together with the management, bought Iceland Frozen Foods. So I'm a de director of Iceland Frozen Foods now. Employed 23,000 people, uh, 5 million customers a week. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it, really? So, so you talk about challenges. <laughs> yeah. It's the biggest investment I've ever made. You know, I'm big on communication within companies and, yeah. and, and, and in, in deals. Tell me, how important is it for you when you're negotiating a deal whether you like, trust, believe the person you're, you're about to sign with? We said, this is not rehearsal, life is for living, you want to enjoy it. Why would you spend time with people that you don't trust, whose values and standards aren't your own, that you don't like? You wouldn't do that. I think it's massively important to try and work with people, employ people that you like, have suppliers that you like, if you can make friends with customers too. I think there's no downside. There are always times you want to go and ask people for help. And if they like you, then maybe they're prepared to go that extra mile and do a bit more for you. I think it's fundamental. There was one question I was going to ask you, which was your biggest regret. And I mentioned that in our conversation yeah. last week. And you said to me, I can't think of one. And it brought home to me more about your mindset, that you're able to take the mistakes or the troubles or whatever and just move on from them. Yeah. The, the, well, I don't 
when you left me last week, that wasn't the end of it as far as I was concerned. I reflected back and played back our conversations in our own mind and thought about the answers I'd given to the questions. When you've no notice of the questions, you just get a spontaneous uh, a reaction and it's not always the one you'd give if you have opportunity to consider it. But I'd give that same reaction today. But I'm saying to myself, you seem rather surprised that I had no regrets. Yeah. But the reason, and so it made me think, well, why is it normal to have regrets? Why haven't I had any regrets? And I think it is just a very negative thing to have regrets. And I think to progress ahead, you've got to be very optimistic and, and, and positive, not negative. And I think that it's very easy to damage that self-belief and positivity. And I think you mustn't let negative thoughts enter your mind. And I think it's quite negative to reflect back and think, oh, if only I'd done it this way. Yeah. So I, I think I just exclude those thoughts from my mind, really. It reminded me of a, of a quote by Jack Nicholas, the famous golfer. And he said, the only reason I'm better than the rest, the number one reason, is because I can put a bad shot out of my mind quicker than they can. Mm. And of course, when we've seen Rory McIlroy, of course, he, you know, he's doing well now, but he, you know, he, he choked in one of his biggest tournaments in America last year. So the mindset. I'm, I'm sure there's something in that. I really am sure. Can you tell me what is your favourite word? Uh, profit. <laughs> F I T P R O F I T. <laughs> what is your least favourite word? Competitor. Yes. Well, competitor. <laughs> Interesting point. Over all those years at DFS, people would come to me and talk uh, about the competition and about competitors and about going to some trade thing with the competition. I would say, look, you don't understand it. There is no such thing as competition. These guys that you're describing as competition, they're the enemy. What these guys are trying to do, they're trying to take the bread out of your children's mouth. They're trying to threaten your lifestyle. So don't talk about competitors. These people are the enemy. And for the whole period of time, I've actually believed that wholeheartedly. And I think it's, it's no bad thing. If, if heaven is real, and in many, 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 many years to come, you are lucky to get a place in heaven, who was the first very person? Lucky. Who was the first person you'd go and say hello to? Anything where you've got heaven or religion, you're likely to offend people or upset them in yeah. some way. And this is a, a spontaneous reaction. I'd want to see Jesus Christ. I'd want to seek him out because I'd want to get some indication and advice on how to create a m miracles. And then I'd go out and do some miracles, I think. Very good. Perhaps. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Business Unplugged is grateful for the honesty and wisdom of well, Lord sure it's wisdom, Kirkham. Right? Honesty, yeah. That was really, that's a new one for that. Really good, thank you. We, we have a few questions for you. Oh, dear me. These are the ones I dare not ask. I didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, quick question. Um, your recent deal with Iceland shows that you've um, not lost your appetite for a good deal. Um, given the chance, would you buy DFS back? No, I wouldn't. And people ask me right at the outset, and you know it's not uncommon for entrepreneur-run businesses like DFS to be taken over by private equity people and for them to cock it up over time and for the you know, original entrepreneur to buy it back. I think that's a uh, past in my life now. You know, and uh, I think I'd do something different, but no, I don't think I ever would buy it. But I really, really mean that. I don't think I'd do it. That's a really good question. I like that one. Um, here's a question What motivates you? Uh, what's pushing you forward? That's a question from one of the Yorkshire Mafia on the internet. Uh, greed. Um, insecurity, constantly wanting to prove yourself. I think it's all those things, but until we floated as a business, and bear in mind we were 24 and a half years as a listed business, and people ask me these sort of questions, I've not a clue how to answer them because I've never thought about it. I've never thought, what motivates me? I just wake up and I do the things that seem to be natural. So it's not special, it's just 
you know, some people can, given a certain sports skill or other skills in life, we all, we all get different things. And God, I think we can all take consolation in my view that God is an accountant and nobody's got the whole lot. You know, if they've got a lot of money, then maybe they're thick or, you know, he balances it all off really. We can't all have everything. And even the people, in my view, that seem to have everything, you know, yeah. the sort of film star looks, they seem to be tremendously intellectual, you know, they've got a tremendous sense of humour, uh, you know, they've got, you know, boatloads of money. Then you suddenly find, if you get to know them, they're riddled of insecurity. Yeah. Nobody has everything, you know. Um, we have another question with regards to your charity work. Yep. Can you tell us what your uh, views are for charities seeking money from companies in the current climate? Yeah, I think that uh, me personally, I've always felt, I said earlier a bit, I'm in a privileged position. So I'm in, in, in a position to be able to help people do things and so where I think it's appropriate I do that I said this morning that we have to set up a bit of a system at work because we get 7,000 people here writing to us that's 140 people a week that's 20 people a day you know asking for support in all sorts of areas well if we supported all those I'd still need support so you, you've got to sort of be, be selective and you know I care about young people I'm involved with the Duke of Emberwood and, and, and Outward Bound and so I, and I think if you can help others you should do it has anybody got any other questions for Lord Kirkham? Oh, gentleman over here, one more. Uh, Lord Kirkham, you're from Doncaster, a proud Doncastrian. I'm a, I'm a proud Doncastrian as well. Right. You've had the chance to move away from Doncaster. Why have you stayed in, in Doncaster? All my answers, I seem to expand them to make them sound interesting because really I'm there because I like it. I just like it there. Then if people ask me that question, I rationalise it because I think that's not enough. And I say well, it's in the heart of the country, you can get to Scotland within 40 minutes, you can get to London, the east-west connections are good as well. But it's because I, I like it there. And I will say this, I spend two or three days a week in London and I come home every possible opportunity because I think it's so easy to get out of touch. And I honestly believe this part of the world is a place that you can have your keeps your feet on the ground. I think that's a characteristic of Yorkshire, people that have the feet on the ground. So perhaps I like it and I like the fact that it keeps you sane. The property's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, once again, round of applause please for Lord Kirkham. Thank you. Excellent work. Thank you. Very good start. Thank you.